Whenever Christian apologists ask me why I don't believe in God, I usually just tell them that I simply haven't heard any convincing arguments that he exists, such as something based on actual evidence. The usual response to that is an insistence that belief in God must be based on faith, not evidence. The problem with this is that there are literally thousands of religions in the world, all of which are based on faith, and almost all of which contradict one another. That means faith is essentially worthless for determining whether or not God exists. So apologists will then often mention their own personal experience with the Holy Spirit. They describe it as a sense of love, peace, warmth, empowerment, and joyous euphoria spreading through their body. It's worth pointing out, however, that nowhere in Scripture is there a description of how the presence of the Holy Spirit is supposed to feel. So, how can they possibly know that what they are experiencing has anything to do with God? Faith that that's what it is? If so, then that Holy Spirit argument is also meaningless. But more significantly, the followers of many other religious persuasions, including even Satanists and atheists, report experiencing that exact same Holy Spirit sensation through prayer or meditation. It can even be induced artificially by simply applying a magnetic field to the temporal lobes of one's brain. That means the experience is evidence of an interesting quirk of the human brain, <laughs> but it doesn't justify belief in Christianity or any other religion. Some apologists will then bring up the events and places mentioned in the Bible that can be corroborated with historical evidence, and they claim this proves the Bible must be true. However, the corroborating evidence is entirely mundane. None of the supernatural events described in the Bible are supported by any independent secular evidence whatsoever. There isn't even any reliable evidence that Jesus himself existed. What evidence we do have is all either entirely anonymous or hearsay. This means that the Bible's historical claims do no more to prove the existence of God than the fact that New York City exists proves the existence of Spider-Man. So that's when apologists will often bring up my favorite justification for their belief, biblical prophecy. According to some apologists, the Bible contains up to 2,500 prophecies, most of which have been accurately fulfilled. Now, setting aside the fact that most other religions also have prophecies that have supposedly been fulfilled as well, are those in the Bible convincing enough to justify belief? Well, for a prophecy to be valid, it must fulfill the following ten requirements. It must have been understood as prophecy when first stated, not claimed to be so after the fact. It must actually have been prophesied in the past, not simply claimed after the fact to have been prophesied. It must be specific enough so that it could describe only one possible event, which was clearly understood before the event occurred. It must be fulfilled within a narrow time frame or by a specific deadline. It must be a highly improbable event, not some common occurrence. It must be something humans cannot deliberately manipulate into happening. It must be fulfilled in a literal way, not some spiritual or metaphorical way that cannot be tested. Its fulfillment must be extremely well documented, ideally with observable evidence. It must not be edited after it was prophesied. And it should not be part of other prophecies with a questionable success record. All of them should be fulfilled. A prophecy that doesn't fulfill all ten requirements can't be trusted as being real. But of course, an all-powerful God could easily ensure any real prophecy fulfills all ten requirements. Unfortunately for apologists, however, not even the best Bible prophecies can pass this test. Most of them are extremely mundane or vague, without specific dates, thus allowing them to be shoehorned into a variety of events throughout history. Many others were never claimed to be prophecies in the first place, or only seem prophetic when improperly translated or taken out of context of their surrounding text. Still others were only fulfilled by their own believers striving to fulfill those prophecies. Many more were written after the events occurred. Some events were claimed to be fulfilled prophecies despite no evidence any prophecy was actually ever made. And some prophecies have clearly failed requiring apologists to water down their meaning and creatively reinterpret them to fit the facts. Finally, creating prophecies that come true isn't all that hard. In 2007, when anti-gay marriage laws were being enacted all over the United States and things looked bleak for marriage equality, 
I made a video predicting that gay marriage would be accepted by the vast majority of Americans within a decade. Today's most contentious issues include embryonic stem cell research and gay marriage. And if the same pattern persists, then within a decade or so, we should see both ideas adopted and accepted by all but the most conservative extremists. And that's exactly what is happening. My prophecy has fulfilled arguably nine out of those ten conditions required for a valid prophecy, which is better than any of the prophecies in the Bible, yet that's hardly evidence that I'm divinely inspired. If the Bible had prophesied that, say, a massive earthquake would occur in a specific place on a specific date, and such an earthquake actually occurred, that would be impressive. But nothing in the Bible even comes close to that level of specificity, and thus its prophecies are insufficient justification for belief. If you don't believe me, try measuring any of the Bible's prophecies against the aforementioned list of requirements. So what's next? Well, some apologists will bring up cosmological arguments. However, I've already addressed those arguments in other videos, so I won't repeat them here. But suffice to say that cosmological arguments only get one as far as deism, not Christianity. Furthermore, the arguments are all based on fallacious assumptions, often dressing them up in philosophical jargon to sound much more impressive than they actually are. Another argument some apologists imagine is particularly devastating to atheism is the claim that atheism cannot account for the laws of logic, because they are immaterial, abstract, and universal, and thus they could only come from an immaterial being. But such an argument is a straw man, since atheism doesn't require belief in only the materialistic world. Logic, like mathematics, is not materialistic, yet there is no reason to believe both are not part of a purely naturalistic universe, or even part of an eternal metaverse that spawned our universe. Also, many Christian philosophers believe that God is omnipotent only as far as what is logically possible. He couldn't create an object so heavy he couldn't lift it, for example. Which would mean logic must exist apart from and above God, and thus God is not necessary to explain logic. The Bible itself indicates God cannot do absolutely anything, which supports the claim that God is limited by abstract laws. Occasionally I'll run into an apologist who claims no one is truly an atheist, that we're really just lying to ourselves because we want to live in sin. For evidence, they quote Romans 1, 19 through 20. Not only is this an assertion that cannot be demonstrated, the evidence that this isn't true can be found in the demographics of religious belief. Hundreds of millions of people belong to widely differing religions, many of them believing in numerous gods, gods that don't resemble the Judeo-Christian god at all, and non-god supernatural entities. For the claim that God has shown himself to everyone to be true, that would necessitate believers of every other religion to be lying as well. But the religions people end up following have more to do with the location where those people happen to be born than with any other factor, which is exactly what we would expect to see if God doesn't exist, but wouldn't make sense if there is a God who wants everyone to be a Christian. Ironically, a larger percentage of theists experience moments of doubt that their God exists then atheists have moments of doubt that God doesn't exist. Also, no child who grows up without any religious indoctrination claims to know God exists. And finally, millions of atheists live lives that are more moral than most Christians. So the whole premise of disbelief so that one can sin doesn't even make sense. When all else fails, some apologists will resort to Pascal's wager, basically claiming that it's better to believe in God just in case he actually exists. Well, apart from the fact that belief isn't something that you can just choose to do, and apart from the fact that if God exists he would surely know that you're just pretending in order to hedge your bets, the thousands of religions in the world show just how small your odds of choosing the right religion actually are. Is it worth wasting your time, money, and opportunities on the tiny chance you'll guess correctly? I certainly don't think so. There are other, weaker arguments apologists make for belief in God, but these are the ones I run across most often. And yet, every one of them crumbles under scrutiny. Thus, I remain unconvinced. But it's even more than that. If there were at least one argument that made sense, it would be enough to reserve judgment. But when every argument fails, belief in the God of the Bible becomes an indicator of either ignorance or irrationality. 
and while the former is both understandable and forgivable, those who are aware of the problems with the arguments for God, yet still believe in and still persist in using those arguments, are a big problem for society. That's one of the main reasons I persist in arguing with theists. I want to know if I'm dealing with a rational person, or if I need to watch my back.